We left off yesterday. We started with one of the Chesapeake area colonies with Virginia, which was the first place a successful settlement was created by which empire or which nation, I suppose? England. All right. But that was just because it was the first doesn't mean it's going to be the last. There's going to be several other places where British, the British established colonies. In fact, they end up with, in North America alone, 13. Another one that is on the Chesapeake, which is very similar to Virginia, is Maryland, or Maryland. It is, an, it is also a plantation colony, founded in 1634 by that handsome gentleman there on the left. I got a silver dollar if anybody can guess who he is. He's a lord. Baltimore. A silver dollar's in the mail. Okay. Baltimore. Lord Baltimore. As in Baltimore, Maryland. It's named after this gentleman. He came from a prominent English Catholic family. Maryland, or Maryland, became a haven for, for Catholics who were being persecuted by Protestants in England, because at this time, Protestant England was still persecuting many Roman Catholics. And so, Maryland was a Catholic haven, a place where people who were being persecuted could flee and have religious freedom. In fact, that's why it's called Maryland. So, Lord Baltimore was absentee, like he really never went there. He was like the proprietor of, of Maryland. But he wanted to provide a place for his, for his uh, fellow Catholics to, to go and be safe. And um, these, you know, the people that went there, there was land available. Um, they, they became pretty wealthy because of the land. And then they, all the people that were there that were small farmers were resentful of the wealthy plantation owners. And this resentment you know, between poor people and rich people, which is happening in the 1630s, still going on today, all over America. So that's another, you know, we talked about struggle, rich people versus poor people, and you still see that going on today. But um, despite the tensions, Maryland prospered, just like Virginia, and it blossomed in acres of what plant? Tobacco. It was another tobacco colony. And just like Virginia, it depended upon labor to, to grow that tobacco. What was the source of the labor for both Virginia and Maryland in the 1600s, mainly? Indentured servants, penniless people who work and bound themselves to, a, to work for a number of years in exchange for their, their passage across the ocean. So basically, it's like you're the poorest people in England want an opportunity at land in the New World. They don't have any money, and to, to you know, a voyage across the ocean is very expensive. It's very expensive. It's not even like a carnival cruise today. It's more expensive than that because it takes weeks. So, a wealthy plantation owner in America would pay an indenture. It would pay a contract. And the people in England would receive the money and pay for their ticket across the ocean. They would arrive and they would show up at the person, person's plantation who paid for their trip. In exchange for the people paying for their trip, they're going to work for them for a, for a number of years. Usually the, the length of the contract or indenture is seven years. Essentially, you're a contracted slave, but it, but you're an Englishman, you spoke English, you had a similar religion, which are all things that other types of labor, like slaves, many slaves, well, they didn't want to be there, obviously, why would they? They didn't speak the same language, had very different customs and religion, and were very expensive, very expensive compared to indentured servants. 
So indentured servitude was really the way to go for labor in the in the in North America long before slavery was was really fully utilized. Okay? Due to the the benefits that it had. Okay, so uh, but as far as Maryland goes itself, it, you know they they extended freedom of religion to everyone, to everyone in the entire colony. It freedom of worship. Um, it it guaranteed, to, well, it wasn't complete religious freedom, not the way we know it, but it it guaranteed religious freedom for all Christians. So you could be Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox. Any kind of Protestant, any kind of Catholic, Christian. Jews, sorry. Which, it seems weird, but this was the most religiously tolerant colony in the early 1600s until Rhode Island came along, which was the most religiously tolerant. They even allowed, like, Indians and Jews and stuff. Very tolerant. Okay? So the act which allowed for this is called the Act of Toleration. It guaranteed toleration to all Christians. However, in the same Act of Toleration, if you denied the divinity of Jesus, there was a punishment. What does that mean? What is it? What is what is this? If you deny the divinity of Jesus, what does that mean? What does it mean to be divine? If you were a person that said, yeah, Jesus was not God. He was just a guy. How would the people of Maryland deal with that? Death. The death penalty was given to anyone who denied the, the divinity of Jesus. So the act of toleration, really not all that tolerant, but still more tolerant than many of the other colonies, where being Catholic was a death sentence as well. It's like, hey, you see those people over there with almost the exact same beliefs as me? Let's kill them. That's kind of how the world was then. We've come a long way, I guess. Okay, questions on Maryland? The West Indies, not one of the original 13 colonies, but still British colonies. This is like the way station to the mainland of America. Where the Chesapeake, they grew the poor man's crop tobacco. In the, in the Bahamas and the Caribbean and the West Indies, they grew a rich man's crop. What was it? Sugar. Sugar cane. Tobacco was a poor man's crop because it could be planted easily, produced commercially marketable leaves and and within a year, it required simple processing. Sugarcane, not so. Very difficult to grow sugarcane. Plus, you can't grow sugarcane in Virginia. You have to have a hot tropical climate. Sugarcane requires extensive planting, extensive and arduous land clearing, and sugarcane stocks yielded sugar only after it is processed, you know, an elaborate process of refining the sugar. You know, sugar granules don't grow in sugar cane. You know, the granules like you put in your tea and coffee? That's not how sugar grows. Okay, It grows on a stalk. To get it from that to granulated sugar takes a process, and it takes a lot of labor. So it is a very, high, very expensive business. It takes a lot of labor. It takes a lot of capital, a lot of money. So to work the sprawling plantations... The, the plantation owners of the West Indies, which is the Bahamas, imported enormous amounts of African slaves. More than a quarter million in 50 years. That's a lot of people. By the year 1700, black slaves outnumbered white settlers in the West Indies four to one. Four to one, the slaves outnumbered the plantation owners. Four to one. 
you guys outnumber me like eight to one. But if imagine if it was four to one and you guys decided that you wanted to like kill me. Could I really fight off four of you? <laughs> Probably. But maybe not. Maybe not if you were strong and you know mean and had a good reason to. Which these people had a good reason to. You know, they were slaves. So why didn't the slaves who outnumbered the settlers four to one just rise up? Kill them and own the land for themselves. Why didn't they do that? Any guesses? Well, in order to control a large population of slaves like that, the English authorities devised a series of formal codes, formal codes, which are called slave codes. All right? The first of such codes is called the Barbados Slave Code of 1661. Barbados Slave Code of 1661. And what it does is it, it defines the legal status of slaves. Which doesn't sound all that interesting, but you would be highly concerned if it were you. Because what this does is it denies the, the most fundamental of rights to these people. These humans, these slaves. And it gave the masters complete control over the slaves. He had zero rights. It even gave the masters, the plantation owners, the right to inflict horrible, vicious punishments for even the slightest of infractions. So you make a tiny mistake, you could lose a limb or a child. Like, oh, you uh, you broke something? Well, now I'm going to break your, break your child's arm. Horrible. Horrible stuff. So, they, but they did this for a reason, to try to, I mean, they were out, the plantation owners were outnumbered, four to one. They, had, they felt like they had to create harsh punishments and a harsh code in order to keep order. Well, did it work? I mean, yeah, there were a few, few rebellions, but, I mean, this is 1661. Did slavery still exist in the West Indies? And all throughout <laughs> the 1600s, 1700s, and most of the 1800s? Yeah, it did. So, um, what, what's so bad about this is when sugar planters began to move northward into the American colonies, they brought their ideas about the slave codes with them. So when sugar planters moved to places like the Carolinas to diversify and not just grow sugar, but grow things like rice and indigo in those also warm climates, they also brought their slave codes with them, which inspired those eventual states and colonies, to make laws governing slavery. And that's kind of how slavery moved into, the, into America from the, from the West Indies. Questions on the West Indies? Okay, the Carolinas. I put the, both of the Carolinas together, north and south. But they are different colonies. In the 1640s, civil war was going on in England. They were fighting amongst themselves. And the king, who was King Charles I, it was, it was really a civil war between the monarchy and the parliament. That's what it was a war between. And Charles I dismissed parliament in 1629. Basically said, you're no longer needed. Parliament has no more power. I'm the king. What I say goes. That was Charles I. Well, if history has taught us anything, the people that you dislike, you really don't want to upset the most are the wealthy and powerful. Ask Julius Caesar how it went when he dismissed the Senate of Rome. Didn't work out too well for him. And it also doesn't work out too good for King Charles I, who ends up being beheaded by those people that he dismissed. 
in the year 1649. Well, somebody's got to take over, and so a, a gentleman by the name of Oliver Cromwell, who was the leader of the military forces of the Parliament, of, the, of you know, those wealthy guys that were dismissed. And after Cromwell, who was not a king, he was just kind of a superintendent of the throne, he ruled England as a king for ten years. And after that time, the son of King Charles I, the guy who, whose head got chopped off, they restored him to the throne in 1660. With the understanding that... Remember what happened to Daddy there, Charles II? You remember what happened to Daddy? You don't want that to be do you now, do you? Good. So, King Charles II is put back in, into authority. However, it's, it's real, who had the real power? Parliament. Parliament had the real power. Okay? So, during this time, in 1670, while more exploration was going on in the New World, they go to, to the area of the Carolinas, and that's what... Carolina, Carolina is actually named for Charles. Kind of like a Latin version of Charles. Okay? Um, as far as what the Carolinas did, you know, they, we, we knew we have tobacco in the, in the Chesapeake. We have sugar in the, in the West Indies. The main export crop in the Carolinas in the 1600s was rice. Rice. It became the principal export crop because rice was an exotic food in England. Very exotic. You can't grow rice in Europe. It's very exotic. Um, but rice was grown in Africa and the Carolinas were paying a premium for West African slaves that knew how to cultivate it. And that's why the, Afri the, uh, you know, the Africans' agricultural skill, plus their relative immunity to malaria, made them ideal laborers on hot, swampy, humid rice plantations. To ship this rice out from the Carolinas, they needed a seaport. What became the busiest seaport in the South in the 1600s? Charlestown, named after... King Charles. Today it's called Charleston, South Carolina. But it's named after King Charles. It became the busiest seaport in the South. Got George on your mind? You guys know that song? Guess not. Okay, so uh, one of the later colonies to be created is Georgia. Georgia is a buffer colony. That's kind of what we refer to it as. You know, we said Rhode Island's a sewer colony. Georgia's a buffer colony. Georgia, with the harbor of Savannah, was formally founded in 1733, long after most of the other colonies. And Georgia was generally valued by the British Crown because of its role as a buffer. What's a buffer? Like if I were to say, I'm going to put a buffer between me and Alyssa, what, is my, what am I going to do? Yeah, I'm going to try to be more separated. So how are we going to think of Georgia as a buffer? What are we separating? Yes. Georgia's... Thank you very much. Very good. Georgia was intended to protect 
the very valuable colonies of the Carolinas, where the rice was being grown, from very vengeful Spaniards in Spain who were still upset about the Spanish Armada getting their rear ends kicked in the English Channel. Who are where? Florida. And also those pesky French, which were located where? Louisiana. So Georgia is going to kind of be a buffer. You want to get to the valuable stuff? You got to get through this basically hot, swampy, desolate land. Good luck. Hope you don't get by, bit by a snake. Georgia, named in honor of King George II of England, and it was basically launched by a group of philanthropists. And Georgia didn't produce too, too much in terms of you know, economics. You know, silk, wine, But what the British did do, because they did want it to be a buffer, they wanted to have people in the way if the French or the Spanish wanted to get through there. Well, they're not going to put valuable people. So one of the problems that England was having is that it was, it was a custom in, in Europe at this time that if you owed somebody money or a bank, you owed them money and you couldn't pay it back, you went to prison. It was called debtor's prison. Needless to say, debtor's prison was overflowing. And so they sent a lot of prisoners from debt in the overflowing debtor's prison. They just shipped them across the ocean to Georgia and said, good luck. Now, are these the most upstanding, high-character, moral people in the world that are being shipped to Georgia? No, they're, they're criminals, essentially. You know, of course, by the today's standards, we'd all be criminals because we all have debt. But... But in those days, you were a criminal. And so they used Georgia as kind of a haven for the wretched souls who were in prison for debt. All right? Now, one of the philanthropists, do you guys know what a philanthropist is? Philanthropist literally is Greek for love of people. Person who wants to do good for people. It's a philanthropist. Is James Oglethorpe. A very dynamic man. And he was interested in prison reform. But he was also not a pushover, and he himself was in Georgia, and he re he literally would go and take some of these debtors, and if he would see Spanish people, he'd go fight them. He would like attack them and repel Spanish attacks. So he believed that he established a, a, a colony of charity by his ener energetic leadership, and it also almost cost him his entire personal fortune. That's James Oglethorpe on the left, the big picture of the face, and King George II in the middle. Um, everybody that was Protestant enjoyed religious toleration in Georgia. No Catholics were given haven. Uh, many missionaries went throughout the colony of Georgia to, uh, to work with the debtors, and to work with many Indians, including a man by the name of John Wesley. Anybody ever heard of John Wesley? Nobody knows John Wesley? You ever heard of Wesleyan College? Or West Virginia Wesleyan? Named after John Wesley. What was his, what was his flavor of Christianity? What kind of school is West Virginia Wesleyan? Methodist. Methodist. He was a Methodist missionary. Okay? All right. So questions on Georgia or any of the colonies we've talked about so far. All right. Okay. So we've talked about some of the colonies. And to, as, you, as, as you can tell with every colony, religion is playing a major role. 
And we haven't even talked about Massachusetts yet. For the people who came there, they came 100% for religious reasons. So in order to do that, we have to go back to Europe, back in time, and talk about why there are some push factors for people to leave Europe and brave a several, you know, a thousand mile, a three thousand mile voyage across the ocean that takes weeks, at a, at a, just for an opportunity, not a guarantee of a better life. So in order to do that, we got to go back in time. When we talk talk with Ma, about Martin Luther, Martin Luther, in the year 1517, he ignited a fire of religious reform. Which now we now refer to as the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther himself was a Catholic priest, but he suffered from some, mm, I don't want to call them disabilities, but he had his own problems. Okay? He had some, his own problems. We would refer to his problem like as scrupulosity. Scrupulosity. You ever heard this word? Everything he does is, is horrible and evil and bad. He just felt bad about everything he did. Like he wasn't worthy of anything. Okay? Um, that's scrupulosity. When you just, you're self-deprecating. You don't have very good high esteem. And, and at the time, the Catholic Church was also doing some pretty corrupt stuff. Pretty corrupt stuff. And, and so he ignited a fire of religious reform that spread throughout Europe for more than a century. Kindling a very deep religious and spiritual fervor in millions of people, some of whom helped to found America. So the timing of him is pretty important. John Calvin came after Martin Luther. Right? Martin Luther is the guy that started it all off. And Martin Luther did so in Germany. John Calvin is from Geneva, Switzerland. And he elaborated on Martin Luther's ideas in ways that profoundly affected the thought and character of generations of Americans up to this very day. And his beliefs, which are now referred to as Calvinism, or Calvinists, became the dominant theological credo not only of New England Puritans, the Pilgrims, but of other American settlers, including people like Presbyterians. You ever heard of Presbyterians? You ever heard of that religion? Okay. Uh, Huguenots. You guys know what a Huguenot is? A Huguenot is just a French Protestant, because most of France was Catholic. If you were a Protestant, you were called a Huguenot. And typically they adhered to Calvinistic beliefs. And the Dutch Reformed Church, like the Dutch created their own little church. So, um, basically, the key aspect to John Calvin's beliefs, which he added to, to Martin Luther's Reformation beliefs, is called predestination. Predestination is the idea that it's, it's, it goes against Catholic teaching, which is what was the only thing that existed for 1,517 years. That, uh, predestination is the idea that good works could not save you to, to help you get sa salvation. Good works have nothing to do with your salvation. So... You know, as far as like the way you treat other people and being good, not necessary for salvation. He believes all you need for salvation is faith. Faith alone. Sola fide is what this is referred to in Latin. Faith alone. It's kind of a, you know, I don't know. So what do he believe? What do he believe? Okay, he believes that, like, just because you feel have any, if you have an emotional attachment to something, then you have to be feeling the presence of God through emotion. 
So if you feel emotion, that is God at work, the Holy Spirit at work. An idea that gets handed down to other Protestant beliefs like um, Pentecostals. Very emotional. Highly emotional in their belief system. Whereas, you know, the previous 1,500 years or so, it was you didn't have to have emotion to know that God was at work in your life. Okay? Because there was the sacraments and there was, like, you knew things. Like, the, the church had established a way for the church, to, for Jesus to be at work in your life. Calvin says it's not necessary. All you have to do is have faith and feel it. If you feel it, then it must be true. Okay? So, um, but much like the Catholic faith, he said not everybody's going to heaven. Not everybody's making it. It's a, the way he chooses who goes and who doesn't go can't be based upon works, though. Because what does he say about works? They're not necessary. So how do you determine who goes to heaven and who doesn't? Well, what, what, what is that P word we just said? Predestination. Predestination, which means that everything's already determined. So from the moment of your first breath at birth, is it already determined if you're going to heaven or hell? Yeah, because it doesn't matter how you live your life. Works don't matter. You want to go murder people and just say, well, I'm sorry. Well, okay, you're forgiven. You're welcome to heaven. That's kind of how a lot of Calvinists operate. Okay? So, this, the, these beliefs have a very deep, deeply, or deeply ingrained in American culture. Very ingrained in American culture. So, um, the people who Calvin believed were going to heaven were called the elect. And the people that were damned and bound for eternal torment, we're called the reprobate. Well, what was the mechani mechanism for how that got determined? Well, when Calvin was alive, it was, oh, you agree with me? You're going to heaven. You disagree with me? You're going to hell. That's how Calvin did it. It gets, a, it gets changed after Calvin's death, and you'll see that, um, especially when we get into the Salem witch trials. All right, um, but you can see how these this this Reformation changed things forever. Um, when it came to like a conversion process, like you go from being unsaved to saved, he he believed that like a conversion process was thought to be an intense personal experience with with God, like in, where God would reveal your, his eternal destiny to you. So the Calvinists swept into England just as King Henry VIII was breaking his ties with the Catholic Church and creating his own church called the Church of England or the Anglican Church. That was King Henry VIII. Um, now, King Henry's actions stimulated many people in England to undertake a complete purification of the English church. They totally wanted to purify any traces of Catholicism from the Church of England. They wanted to be pure, pure, pure. And that's why they're called Puritans. And in order to do that, they had to separate. They had to separate themselves from England. They were separatists. And they wanted to de-Catholicize the Church of England and purify it of all traces of, Christ, of, of Catholicism. So, being separatists, they wanted to go somewhere where they could do it on their own. First, they go to Holland. They go to Holland in 1608, where they wanted to find a haven where they could live and die as Englishmen, and with their own religious beliefs. However, when they arrived in, in England, they, they, they were met with, or I'm sorry, when they arrived in Holland, they were met with poverty, and eventually, like, their children were growing up in Holland, and so they were becoming Dutch. 
the desification of their children. That's not very good for a proud Englishman for your children to grow up wearing wooden shoes and speaking Dutch, right? They didn't like that. So what's the next logical refuge? The New World. America was the next logical place to go. So despite the early ordeals of Jamestown, remember they were like eating each other and digging up dead bodies and having to kill, yeah, really bad stuff. Despite the early troubles at Jamestown, they were willing to risk their lives and willing to, to take a chance. So after they negotiated with the Virginia Company of London, the joint stock company, to secure rights to, to go, they set sail in their boat called the Mayflower for Jamestown. They missed their destination. A storm blew them off course, and they arrived way north of their destination in a rocky coastal outcropping off of what is now referred to as New England. And they landed in 1620 with 102 people. One person died on the way and one person was born on the way. Left with 102, arrived with 102. They named the little baby born Oceanus because he was born on the ocean. Anyway, uh, most of them were the separatists, the people that wanted to completely purify the church, purify the, the Church of England from Catholicism. And the other half were non-believers. They just kind of wanted to get out of, get out of England. Um, the most notable of the non-believers was a man by the name of Miles Standish. You ever heard of him? He became known for his, his abilities to kill Indians and negotiate with them. But they, did they arrive at Jamestown? Are they at Jamestown? All right, we'll pick up with this tomorrow. Think about the pilgrims.